arbitrary detention or freedom of religion, and they need to be recognized and encouraged. And the rapporteur in Iran is one of them, just to give an example. And of course, the Commission of Inquiry on North Korea, and there are many others. That said, coming back to the things that you said and the things that I mentioned, there are real problems. Uh, the fact that all these dictators were just elected and others the year before, Venezuela is a member of the Human Rights Council. We heard from the aunt of Leopoldo Lopez. Uh, these are real problems, and no one is speaking out against them. You know, when, when we launched our campaign uh, today, uh, some in the diplomatic community were very upset and thought what we were doing is, is, is wrong and, and absurd and that it's against the purpose of the Council. And frankly, uh, I cannot think of what is more contrary to the purpose of the Council than electing those who are, whose whole goal is to undermine the system. Countries that don't have a blot on the system, but countries where the blot is the system. And these are real problems and people do not sufficiently address them here. Uh, and you know, you, the, the part of the problem is the culture. Uh, one EU state had to be elected recently, and in order to be elected, they had to go to the very large non-aligned movement, which includes many notorious human rights abusers. And this EU foreign minister in New York pledged on the eve of the election, he said, don't worry. Don't worry, I believe in cooperation. That the Human Rights Council is about cooperation. And cooperation is a wonderful world. We learn it as children, we all should cooperate. But what the word meant to that group in that context at that time was silence in the face of oppression. That you guys, knowing that he was speaking to a room of many human rights abusers, you can do what you want and don't worry, that, that, don't, don't fret that we will encourage action, emergency sessions against you. We are going to look the other way. That was the code. Uh, that was the, the veiled message, and they got it too well. So to be elected, you often have to defer to the worst abusers, and, and these problems need to be addressed. Uh, a, a few questions. Yang Jianli, you, you didn't speak for, 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 for too long, and I want to, to uh, as I promised, ask you a few questions. One is if you could say a word about Wang Binjang. Uh, tell us, and, and um, uh, why don't you do that, then I have another question. Oh, okay. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to share with you the story of Wang Binjang. Wang Mingzhang is one of the founders of overseas Chinese democracy movement. He went back to China. Actually, he, went, he, on, he was on the way to go back to China through Vietnam. He, he got kidnapped in Vietnam in 2002, then taken um, uh, back to China, later sentenced to life imprisonment. He's a medical doctor. He received his uh, doc doctor from uh, McGill University uh, in Canada. And as we speak, he's languishing in the solitary confinement in China. He has been in solitary confinement for more than 12 years. 12 years. So uh, just beyond imagination. Uh, so um, we continue to promote his case and ask um, especially those who uh, happen to be um, uh, you know, in the post of uh, power. You know, that, that, that requires a high level engagement um, to resolve his issue. So we really urge um, uh, the officials of various government and officials of UN to um, pay attention to his case and also to engage with China uh, for his uh, freedom. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask you one more question and, and, then, uh, and then ask uh, a panel question. Uh, you were a political prisoner. How long were you in prison for? Uh, five years. For five years. You, you don't talk about it very much, and when, and, and when we ask you to sometimes, it's not something you like to talk about. And maybe that's personal, maybe it's cultural. You don't like to talk about yourself, I know that. But I think it's very important for people to know that that, uh, that, that you, you did go through that horrific experience, and when you speak about Wang Binjang, maybe you didn't have the same experience he did, but you, you know what it is to be a political prisoner. We heard from Professor Kotler at the beginning of the session. Uh, you know, here in Geneva at the United Nations, we're, we're not on the ground. We're on the ground at, at the UN. We're in the, we're in the business of words. We give speeches, we make statements, we make press communications, we have coalitions, we have conferences. Uh, we try to put a spotlight. As some people say, uh, why does it matter? Mm -hmm. um, you are a political prisoner. Uh, do these things matter? Uh, do, do things that are said here uh, matter for someone sitting in prison thousands of miles yeah. away yeah. in an authoritarian regime? How does it matter? What should people do? Yeah, my, my case is a very good example. 
whole uh, international community's uh, pressure resolves the issue of prisoner of conscience. Uh, I went to prison in 2002. Uh, I was first detained for in solitary confinement for nearly 15 months. During that time, I had no information about what's going on outside the world. I almost lost hope. You know, being there, one can easily lose hope because one cannot help thinking things like, oh, all my friends has already forgotten me. Oh, my family has abandoned me. So, you know, I almost collapsed until the U UN uh, working group on arbitrary detainment, illegal detainment, uh, judged that my case was illegal uh, detention and make, make it a decision public. And also with the effort of U uh, uh, US Congress, both houses passed the resolution on my case. And of, lot of, of course, a lot of international rights groups work for my case. And, and the Harvard community, Berkeley community, all worked for my case. And with this pressure, the Chinese government agree, agreed to let my legal counsel to come to see, visit me in prison. I learned the outpouring support I received while I was in solitary confinement. And I was encouraged to stand up, to defend my rights, and also defend uh, the rights of my inmates. And uh, after that, my prison situation improved gradually with the pressure from the international community. And I received a sentence of five years in prison, which came as a surprise to everybody. Because without the international pressure, I would easily be sentenced to 10 years, 15 years, even life imprisonment, as my friend uh, Wang Bingjiang. And uh, I just tell you some numbers. My case really required, I think any other case requires a high level engagement. And it depends on how strong the various uh, democracy commits themselves to the human rights abuses uh, resolution, like the one oh, uh, I involved. It, it involves, it, it took President Bush to talk to his Chinese counterpart three times. Secretary Colin Paul once, he soon left office. Secretary Rice took the office. She raised my case to her Chinese counterpart three times. The US ambassador to China raised my case to Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China. How many times? Guess. Three times? Four times? 10 times? More than 60 times. Where are you a US citizen? I, no, I'm not a US citizen. So he intervened? I in was not a US citizen. citizen. I'm not Did you have, today. You have a doctorate from two universities? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I just, this example just show you China as I said yesterday, is not immune to the pressure about human rights. It may take longer than we want it, but eventually, everything we do matters here. And everything we do will have some effect in China. Thank you, and, and it's, it means it's, it's not just if it gets to the level of presidents and secretaries of state and ambassadors, other things make a difference as well, things that happen here, NGOs. Exactly, so it, the beauty of a democracy is that the grassroots movement will get the politicians to do something. Uh, my case is not begin from top, actually from, begin from grassroots uh, movement. My family, my friends, uh, Gerald Ganser, my, uh, my classmate in uh, Harvard, ex uh, spearheaded uh, global effort on my behalf, publish uh, op pads and uh, press conferences, at every uh, critical moment of uh, my imprisonment, generate the pressure on the U.S. government. Then the, the U.S. government, in turn, general, generate uh, pressure on the Chinese government. 
So that's the beauty of democracy. So no matter you are a government player, actor, or non-government actor, what you do matters. Thank you. Well, uh, words matter. Words matter. Words are father to deed. Uh, perhaps the final question, I don't, don't think we have much more time. Uh, Jacob spoke about uh, the idea of how human rights is sometimes portrayed as a form of cultural imperialism. And we know it's a phenomenon, we hear it at the United Nations, and probably also in the region, that when people demand human rights, universal human rights, invoke the United Nations Universal Declaration on Human Rights, some regimes respond and say, well, you do things your way, we do things our way. We have cultural differences. Is that, you live in Asia, you're in Cambodia, is, is that a, a subject that comes up? Is there that uh, tension between universal human rights? Have, have governments invoked exceptions, cultural exceptions, why they shouldn't be held accountable to what we regard here as fundamental human rights? And I ask, you're someone who's in Cambodia, you're also part of Liberal International, and so you belong to the liberal uh, idea. This morning, I was watching TV and I could not believe it because in Uganda this morning, they passed the law on anti-gay marriages for life. You take life. And then the Prime Minister or President of Uganda said, oh, if the West thinks that gay rights is the, is the, the gay, gay people have rights, that's for the West, but not for Uganda. I said, wow, incredible. But this really is always the word of dictators. It's always the words of leaders who should not lead anymore. And that is why it is important to us to really start working and putting seeds of democracy at the village level. I comp I, we, as opposition of Cambodia, why do we all of a sudden in five years' time, now we've been fighting for 15 years, almost uh, 20, 18 years, but the last five years was incredible because we said we take it no more. We be went and we campaigned and we campaigned and we campaigned and we now have a Cambodia Spring. It comes from what? It comes from us taking every day going from door to door, and we call ourselves the um, barefoot politicians. Why? And it is important to go to our village people and say, you know what? Human rights, the rights to have land is fundamental. Whether it is in the US, whether it is wherever, it is fundamental. And don't let this dictator tells, tell you that he can take care of your land for him because he's the leader. Don't let this dictator tell you that. But that is the US. That is, not Ameri that is in America. Don't listen to this opposition. And I happen to have an American citizen. I'm, I have dual citizenship. But, you know, because of that, I say just because of that, I had a chance to be exposed I had the privilege to, ha to, be e to be exposed to the fundamental right, the right to speak, the right to think, the right to act, and that must be transferred to the people of Cambodia, to the people of the world. And then I will retire soon, from polit not from politics, but from taking, uh, running again. I want to spend my time mentoring young generation, this generation of activists, and to think for, with them, to say, you don't have to take 10, 15, 20 years, but we have to start young, at a young age, and to say everything is about human rights and everything is about politics. Wow. Well, uh, I, I think whatever young generation gets to benefit from your mentoring will be exceedingly lucky to benefit from your knowledge, your commitment, and your passion. So with that, uh, we conclude the sixth annual Geneva Summit. I want to thank you all for being here and those who are watching on live webcast around the world. Thank you all for participating. Uh, and 
I, I hope you'll take uh, some of the messages you heard and at least commit to some actions on some issues. Uh, you can't do everything on everything, but commit to some actions and, and, and make a difference. Uh, so thank you very much. With that, I'd like to call up uh, all of today's speakers you know, for our uh, final presentation and photo. For all the speakers, you can stay here. After all, please come forward. Uh, all all our, our speakers from today, Anik, uh, please come forward on the stage. We're Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you get everybody up? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. I realize that people can, you know, have to move their things. Yeah. I also invite up all the uh, co sponsors uh, of the Geneva Summit, Tamara from Liberal International and the others, if you can uh, come up, those who are co sponsors of the summit, uh, please come up. We're going to have a, a photo and final presentation. We were supposed to have the signing of the declaration. That is, uh, we're still negotiating some final text, so we're going to have to publish that on the internet. Um, uh, just a final uh, notice uh, from uh, our friends from the Rwandan mission. There's going to be a commemoration of the genocide against the Tutsi. Uh, it'll be on February 26th here at CICG, so that's tomorrow in the same room at 5.30 to 6.30, minute of silence and remarks, and a special event to commemorate the 20th uh, commemoration of the genocide against the Tutsi tomorrow here at 5.30. So will everyone uh, from all the speakers come forward. Uh, our NGO sponsors, also our, our special visitors, Ellie, people who come from our mission, also come, come up, you're invited. Uh, and our interns also. Staff, UN Watch staff, fellows and interns, please come up. There's Shayla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm coming.
Time's running to go out for a minute. Oh, okay. 